Hawkins here, the frugal crafter, and Kathy's back! Yay! How are you feeling? I'm better. I'm you look better. great. I'm not 100%, but I'm getting better. <laughs> and poor Lorraine's got a sore throat. <laughs> she sent me an email. It's not meant to happen. I know. She's like, she's like, I'm so glad Kathy didn't come in because I've got a sore throat and my voice is hoarse. So, yeah. They, or maybe they're the same person. We can't get them in the same place at the same time. Ooh, that'd be weird. Freaky. I want to send her a shout out to, I think, my number one fan this week. I think I'm going to do fan of the week. A new feature. Oh, that'll Cindy, be so fun. Cindy Stewart. She has uh, been so supportive of the channel. She has started a pin board. She's pinned so many of my videos. Oh, she's shared on, on Facebook and Google+. Plus. She's been very active in the, uh, the Facebook group. So, um, Cindy is our fan of the week. So, yeah. yay, Cindy! I have to say I'm kind of out of the loop because I was sick enough, so I was not on Facebook. I am so behind in your videos. And oh. Some blog posts. And... <laughs> well, that's right. You get to come up here and you know experience. Everything. It's all <laughs> everywhere. Oh. All right, we got a lot of questions, so we should probably uh, dive right in. Okay, Nancy Martinez. Hi, Lindsay. My question is, how do I make a glue pad? I've seen the Martha Stewart glue pads that is great for glitter stamping. Uh, is it cheaper to buy it or make my own? And if I buy a glue pad, what kind of glue do I use to refill it? All right, first of all, I have never met a glue pad that I can stand. I've tried uh, several. I've tried the palette. I've tried um, uh, the Martha Stewart. And they're great when you first stamp them and you sprinkle the glitter on, but then it flakes off. You slide it, you slide your, if it's a scrapbook page, you slide it in your page protector and the glitter just goes away so yeah. I think the best thing to do is to get some cosmetic sponges you know the little makeup foam wedges you can get at the dollar store and Mod Podge or even any any clear glue Mod Podge seems to really hold well I think because it kind of remains a little tacky the glossy Mod Podge that really clings to the glitter yeah um so I would just you know dip the sponge applicator in there and I would tap that on your stamp stamp and sprinkle it with glitter and then it's gonna hold it a lot better than a than a glue pad they don't really work that great. And um, afterwards, you know, if you want to go over it with a little bit of Mod Podge to seal it a little bit better, you can. But I find just the, you know, just the Mod Podge and sprinkling the glitter on holds it really well. Uh, that's my advice. Maybe there's been new technology and glitter glue pad and glue pads over the past year or two, but I've never been happy or very successful with one. It does help if you're using certain glue pads to heat, heat it afterwards. Another thing you can try is the heat and stick powder. Um, Oh, what's the, is it QKR Stampede? It's something with the word Stampede in it. We saw them at the yeah. same show. Um, they have a really good heat and stick powder. It works a lot better than the Stampin' Up heat and stick powder. It really clings glitter. I uh, glittered yeah, a clothespin when I was in a, when I was in a hurry with that stuff. That works really good. Uh, the Stampin' Up stuff doesn't hold quite as well. But, um, so I would either do heat and stick powder or I would do uh, a Mod, Mod Podge on a little cosmetic sponge. Okay, and Sandy Lee does Thread Age. Yes. Yes. Just, just, just like anything, any, any, any natural, especially organic, the silk, cottons, and stuff. But polyester does too, and especially if you're talking about older, older thread that might be on wooden spools, you have to think about like in the same thing in scrapbooking and stuff. The wood is going to transfer acids and stuff. I never thought of that. That's a great into point. the material that's wrapped around it and contribute to the deterioration. And sun, if it wasn't ever stored, mm -hmm. right, then sun can deteriorate tremendously, which it does to all things. Um, so yes, to check it, I wouldn't really recommend using it without checking it. And I had some with me and I was going to bring it down <laughs> and I left it upstairs. But um, you want to like wrap a little bit around your finger and like pull slowly apart. And if, if the thread is starting to come apart and kind of just starts weakening and breaking, then you don't want to use it. You want like a nice firm, you know, put some good pressure on it. A nice firm, a bit, so oh, sorry, it's pull yeah. it apart here. A nice firm, like pop, yeah. and then it's good. But if it, if you're going like this and it's just snapping and snapping, you don't want to use it. And okay. some people think that it would be okay to use for hand things like sewing on a button. I really wouldn't recommend that at all. And if you, I have some silk thread on wooden spools. It's just adorable and it breaks very easily. I don't use it for anything, but I haven't thrown it away because it's, it's pretty. Just, it's pretty. <laughs> but yeah. How long does thread last typically, like a cotton poly blend? Um, there, there's no real, you know, definite age. Mm -hmm. Different companies feel their thread will last longer. Yeah. Um, polyester lasts longer than mm -hmm. a cotton. Yeah. 
um, or you know cotton wrapped polyester might last a little longer because it's got the polyester mm -hmm. in it but this no you know website after. right to recommend um yeah there's there's a lot of a different you know information out there that you can find you can find stuff on th thread gauge and in the age but there's a guy called um dr bob and he does thread therapy and he's actually from a thread company but i've seen a lot of information about him and he's supposed to be you know pretty cut and dried and just gets the facts out there and um so it's not really just a commercial there's some good information so you can check him out on youtube and again we'll that's trying to get a link for that thread therapy dr bob and it talks about the strength and testing it different like what the different twists are and what it means and okay so sharon du cordre how can i revive my ancient page ink pads um I was looking actually to see if the reinkers were still available. I'm wondering if that ink might be uh, discontinued because I have a, a like a color box, one of the um, pedal points of ancient plays. I haven't plays. seen it. Yeah, Crap. I'm thinking it might be uh, maybe no longer, but I bet you could use like another dye based reinker. Um, she seemed to think it was pigment based, but well, it might be a pigment dye, but I but it's not like a greasy ink. It's more of like a archival ink. I bet you could use like Ranger Archival. Uh, to ink that. Yeah, I yep. think so. I think that sounds like the same kind of. I think it is. Sh shades. And so yeah, similar look, similar color colorway too, dust, and I think it's also like a together. waterproof, um, dye based, ink. Okay, Rufus, 1931. I've got a question for you. I've got those cream metallic rubs that come six in a row. Think maybe they originally sold for ceramic work. Anyhow, some of the colors have gotten sort of dry. What can I do to bring them back? They look fantastic, lightly rubbed over an embossing folder. I would put a little drop of um, baby oil or mineral oil in there, and I would just work it in and let it absorb, and then you should be back in business. I love those too. I use them on my scrapbook pages to distress the edges of things. They are wonderful. Now, can I ask why, like, oil-based thing instead of a glycerin? Because it is, they are oil-based, they're like a wax-based, so the okay. glycerin won't really get in there and reactivate it would re anything. It would repel yep. because, yep. okay. Um, Amber Cook wants to know what is the difference between craft and art artist acrylic paint aside from the price? Um, well, the pigments they use typically your and it's not always true, but typically your artist color is going to be um, mostly pigment, and your opacity will come from the pigment rather than like a light blocker or a filler. And um, and it's by it's it's like the binder and the pigment, and that's that. So if it was acrylic paint, it would be acrylic and pigment and and uh, usually a pure pigment and that's why you pay a lot more for like cadmium red than you do for yellow ochre because cadmium red is made from cadmium and yellow ochre is made from iron um, and then now with the popularity of people wanting to buy all these other colors they do sell mixes for artists so the craft paints have a lot more mixed colors uh, they may use uh, synthetic dyes rather than pigments um, if you stick with a good craft paint, though, I think for the applications that you had asked me about, they will be good. She was, you know, painting shapes and wood and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, but basically, it's the price and um, what what it cons what it consists of. So you can get pure pigment craft acrylics. They will be a little bit more, kind of in between the um, artist grade and the craft grade. But um, if you're just, you know, painting, doing some decorative painting, doing painting that you know you don't need that really thick impasto paint for effects your craft paint will be good, but get a good brand like a Ceram Coat or a Folk Art or Americana. Those are all real good brands. Okay, and Corey K asks, what is the difference between P.H. Martin's India Ink and liquid watercolors? All right, Dr. P.H. Martin makes both, and um, the big difference is the binder, that India Ink has a shellac in it, and the watercolor does not. Also, there's less of a color shift between the India Ink when it dry and then the watercolor when it dries, so India Ink will stay um, as bright as it is when you begin, as when it dries, whereas watercolor does uh, lighten up. And I think it's because of the water you typically add. But I do notice even the liquid watercolors, maybe it's just the sheen because of the shellac and the ink. It keeps it above on the paper's surface and it doesn't absorb into the paper such as water, like watercolor yeah. wants to yeah. do. Yeah, it, do so. it does something because it definitely holds yeah. its, it really its holds intensity its color. From, yeah. from wet to dry. Um, Emily Clauser, hi there. I have Art Advantage tubes of watercolor paints. I was wondering if I could squeeze them onto a palette to have little cakes of paint. But the thing is that the only palette I have closes up. I'm concerned if the paints would drip and mix in with each other and if this would be all right for my paints. 
All right, well, the Art Advantage is a student line of paints. I think it's, um, it might even be put out by one of the craft stores, Hobby Lobby or Michaels or something. Um, so I would mix a little glycerin in the, like a couple drops. So you squeeze out your paint in your palette, add about two or three drops of glycerin and stir it in. Or you could add a couple drops of honey, that will also keep it moist. And then um, stir it in, leave it open and let it dry until it's, until it's not runny. So you wanna be able to touch it. You might leave a fingerprint in it and it might feel a little gooey, but like if you were to tip it upside down, it wouldn't like ooze out. So you want it, it could be tacky, but not, not that gooey, maybe just a little tacky. Then you'll be able to close it up and use it um, in that palette. That's fine. I have watercolors and palettes like that because sometimes I try out a different brand of color and I don't want to put it in my main, my main palette. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I do too. It, it'll be just fine. Okay. And Lori Cass, I would like to just try out water-soluble crayons before investing in artist quality. I keep looking at Crayola washable crayons. Is that what I want to try? I don't think so. I think you'd be very disappointed. Those are more for kids um, to use and they're just easier to clean up. Um, Reeves makes a set of watercolor crayons that are decent. Um, what I honestly would do though, if I were you, is I would go to an art store or I would order online from a company that has a good open stock selection and I would order a few colors of Karen Dosh crayons. There's a huge jump between the Karen Dosh crayons and um, the student grade crayons. Like there's some like uh, the Faber-Castell watercolor crayons are rubbish. You really don't want those. They're so, so hard. They're, they're really hard mm. to get color out of. The Reeves is probably the best student grade um, watercolor crayons. Um, Carrot Aquarelle makes a good one. Um, it's K-A-R-A-T is the brand and Staples used to carry it. I don't know if they still do or not, but that's, um, that's kind of, um, I guess it's still considered artist quality, but not quite as good as a Caran d'Ache. Uh, I guess it depends on what you can afford, but I think you're better off, say if you had $10 to spend, I think you're better off to buy a few individual Caran d'Ache crayons and try them out. Um, or you could get the full, you might be able to get the full set of Reeves, um, like the 24 crayons for that. But the Reeves is more, they're more transparent, they're more like watercolor, they're less opaque, whereas like the Caran d'Ache is more opaque. So you you have the Reeves one, the Reeves watercolor crayons, yes. and they're more transparent. Yes. So the Caran d'Ache are much more opaque. But, so. but nice. Quite, they're nice. Quite nice. Yeah, they're nice. So what are you talking as far as price? Price jump. Um, a piece, do you know? The Karen Dosh crayons will probably be about $2 a piece. Maybe less if there's oh, a sale. It's not bad. That's not too bad. I actually I mean, think it's cheaper to buy them individually get, than get a, in a set. Get quite a few crayons yeah. for 10 bucks or. Yeah. And go with like your vivid colors and probably a white so you can mix and blend because they do blend really well. They're very soft. They're very nice to use. Okay. Jazz Monkeyfication. How do you make your own canvases? Okay, um, and she's also looking for frugal alternatives, so I don't know if it's necessarily the most frugal to stretch your own canvases, but um, what you do is you order stretcher bars, so you order them in pairs. So if you wanted to make a 16 by 20 canvas, you'd order a pair of 16 and a pair of 20, and they'd come, um, actually, let me pause, I'll go grab, actually, let me just grab them because they'll be taking me longer to pause them. Ah, you know what, I do have to pause it because that's down at the bottom of a bucket. Anyway, okay, let me just, let me just explain. <laughs> It's, uh, they're these, uh, you get these pieces of wood that have a mitered um, corner and they've kind of like got cut tongue and groove things on the side so you just put them together. You don't need any tools. They just slide together. And um, then you take a piece of canvas and I just get mine at the fabric store. I actually get it at Martin's because it's a lot cheaper. It's like mm. $3.99 a yard. And um, you cut it so it's about four inches bigger than your than your frame that you've made on all four sides. Now, if you have a hand, if you're so handy or you know somebody's eight handy. Eight inches bigger then. Right. Yeah. An additional yeah. four inches on each side. Okay. Right. So you said four inches right. all the way around. Yeah. Eight inches. Sewer over here. <laughs> um, or if you know somebody that works with wood, they can make you a frame out of it, whatever the cheapest wood is you can find. That'll be just fine. These stretcher bars are pine. They're nothing fancy. Um, and then you want to spray, spritz the canvas with a little bit of water and that's going to loosen the fibers. Right. And then using pliers, you pull the canvas around to the back and you staple it on the back. That way you can finish your painting around to the edges and not have to frame it if you don't want to. Um, but I'm sure you can find canvas stretching tutorials online pretty easily. Uh, so you staple it all the way around and then you need to give it a couple coats of gesso or the primer of your choice for whatever medium you're working in. Acrylic gesso is usually a pretty good bet for whatever medium you want. Um, now, that isn't necessarily going to be the cheapest. Your stretcher pairs of stretcher bars are probably going to be a couple bucks a piece and then you've got to buy your canvas. Um, I know that for 16 by 20 size, there's a company called Creative Mark and they're sold through Jerry's Artorama and maybe some other companies, but you can get like a package of 12 or or six packs or 12 packs, they round, they end up being three or four bucks a piece. So I think it's cheaper to do that than to do it yourself, honestly. Okay, I'm, I'm confused, and mm -hmm. maybe no one else is that paints, but you're saying stretcher bars, that's actually 
the wooden frame yeah. that you put together. It's not like another tool that you use. Okay. Right. Yeah. The stretcher right. bars. You buy you buy two pairs to make one frame. So okay. you know. I'm just thinking of kind of like a clamp thing, and yeah. then you have the frame. But no. No. It's a very okay. it's very easy to make a frame with uh, stretcher bars and canvas. But whether it's the most affordable, it's it's very affordable if you're doing a big canvas or if you're doing weird shapes right. that would be expensive. Yeah. But if you're doing standard shapes. You know, you better off just to order them. Find some deals. Yeah, and, and the craft and then stores you have, to have think them. of the work, and then going yeah. to the store mm -hmm. and, and getting the fabric and yeah. getting the bars and yeah. having staples and the gun. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Not everyone has a Martin's <laughs> to go pay <laughs> top dollar for the canvas. Okay, so. Julie Montoya. What type of medium could you put on a canvas so that watercolor will work on it? Well, you know, I don't think I would recommend doing that. I would get uh, Fredericks Makes Watercolor Canvas, and it's uh, sold by the pad, and it's actual canvas treated for watercolors. Mm. And if you love it, you could frame it under um, with a mat under glass, or you could actually stretch it onto stretcher bars. Oh, wow. Um, although it's a watercolor, I still would highly suggest you put it, a mat and glass on it. And that you, is like Dick Blick? And oh, yeah. Easy to find Yeah, anywhere. it's just Fredericks Watercolor Canvas. I would do a Google, Google search, and I would, um, I would shop around, because I even priced in a long time. I don't know okay. how much right now. Jacqueline O'Keefe, do you have any suggestions on storing 3D paper crafts you plan on selling in the future? Um, I have a big box and I just kind of gently put things in there and then I don't, it, it, they won't last too long. You'll be able to do a couple craft fairs and then stuff's going to start to get dented and bent. But um, I just have a kind of a big box and I gently place things in and, you know, hope for the best. Hannah wonders if you have some tips on using mica powder. Yeah, one of my favorite things to do is to just um, stamp with Versamark ink or any embossing ink and then use a uh, soft, you can even use a makeup brush, It'll, like go to the dollar store and get a makeup brush if you don't have a soft uh, mop brush and just um, dip it into the powder and just dust it right over the uh, stamped image. It sticks and it's beautiful. If you're using um, Perfect Pearls, you don't need a binder on top. If you're using Pearl X or eyeshadow, then you'll need uh, to spray a little hairspray or fixative on it. Um, you can use it to dust over clay uh, before you cook it. It gives it a really beautiful finish. Um, you can mix it with um, gum arabic and make your own watercolors. I have a video on that. Or mix it with Mod Podge and make your own acrylics. There's so much you can do with mica powders. Just uh, sky's the limits. Just start playing with it. Don't don't think it's too precious to use because you know the Pearl X can be expensive, but it goes a really long way. And have fun with it. Use it. Okay, Mrs. Morcor um, bleh, Mrs. Cormac Corn Cornick. Sorry, I've got Lisa. We'll call her Lisa. Really, <laughs> really need reading glasses. <clears throat> I didn't want to wear them on camera. I was wondering, what is the difference between distressed ink and regular ink? Um, it's got an agent in it that keeps it wetter longer, so that's why it blends really well when you use it with the um, the foam blenders and whatnot. I think that agent is probably glycerin or oxgall, um, and it just helps kind of your sponge glide across the paper. And then when you spray it with water, it gives you those really cool effects because it also keeps it from absorbing into the paper. It kind of makes it sit on top. So that's a big big difference. Um, and that that attribute which makes it so desirable for that makes it less desirable for stamping. So you get kind of blotchy images when you stamp because it's so juicy and it's got that kind of slipperiness to it. It kind of wants to beat up on your stamps. Right. So it's a great um, ink for doing those doing those blended effects and um, kind of rouging the edges. Not the best for stamping, but but you know, there's you're not going to find one ink that's going to be perfect for everything. For everything. Um, and speaking of Oxgall, um, LR Marsh, I have a question related to acrylic paint. In a previous Ask a Crafter, you mentioned using glycerin to extend wet work time when using acrylic paint. But I'm wondering if Oxgall, normally used with watercolors, can be used with acrylic paint to also extend the wet work time. You can. What I would do is I'd put a, uh, a few drops into your working water. I wouldn't put it directly into the paint because that could affect the bond. Or um, if you're, you've are you got a big palette of paint and it's starting to dry out, you could try putting like um, a few drops in a spray bottle and some water and just giving a light mist. You don't want to put too much in because it will affect the integrity of the acrylic paint. But yeah, you can put a, a lot of decorative painters will put it into their water to make the water wetter basically or make your paint flow a little bit better. Okay, and Wolfen 8S. I have oodles of Prismacolor pencils. I am a longtime graphite lover, so this color is overwhelming. I read that these colored pencils work best when you work dark to light, plus using a lot of pressure. Is that true? Could you show us how that works? I've been building the color with low pressure, and I'm not entirely happy with the results. All that white bleed through. Best paper to use with Prismacolor pencils? Um, I think that 
really it's personal preference. Some people like a toothier paper so they can really layer it on there, and some people prefer a smoother paper so that they can color it quickly. Uh, I like cardstock. I like actually stamping up cardstock. I really love for colored pencil work. Um, Cansome Tints is rougher, and that's really w nice to use as well. Um, it's personal preference, and I do have a lot of tutorials on doing the, the blending techniques uh, with a lot of pressure, so please go to my channel. I'm going to put together a colored pencil playlist to help you out. We got one more question, but we're going to come right back in just a second and answer it. Okay. We're back! Yay! <laughs> going a little over today, but this question needs a little more time than, than uh, 10 seconds. <laughs> and we have Iso Mati, I think. As an animal rights protector, animal welfare activist, and vegetarian, what sort of products should I look out for when I am out shopping that may have animals in them like oils, hair, bone, etc.? All right, so you can see why this is going to take a little longer than 10 seconds to answer. Um, there are animal byproducts in many of the art supplies that you use. And the way I look at it, I, my diet is plant-based. I have a vegan diet, but... Um, to live my life completely vegan would be impossible. I, you know, I have shoes that have leather in them. My children and my husband eat meat. So, um, personally, I can't be a perfect vegetarian. Um, but the things you want to look for... Be very, very restrictive. Yes, yes. And some things that I look for, like for brushes. I don't buy brushes that have Kalinsky sable or any, any sort of mink in it mm -hmm. because I don't want to support the fur trade. Um, the rest of my family eats pork products, so I don't have a problem by, I feel like, you know, that I already have that blood on my hands, so, um, so like your natural bristle brushes are going to have, our, you know, th that's hog bristle. So, you know, that's an animal byproduct. The way I look at it is, I haven't had to replace these brushes in 20 years. They've held up. Um, if I was buying plastic or nylon brushes for my oil painting, they would deteriorate and I'd have to replace them every year. And that's more in the landfill. But you know, if you want to avoid it, you want to avoid um, hog bristle. You might not want to use oil paints either because you're gonna go through. You're gonna blow through a lot of brushes if you use that. Um, so hair and brushes. You want to make you buy synthetic brushes. Um, and whether it's worse or better to be getting so many petroleum-based products, you know, yeah. that's, that's... Going to <clears throat> landfill, which also yeah. damages the, the, damages the environment. So, the animals. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's so it's, it is, yeah, it's a really hard call. So I try to, try to buy things that you can keep, the, that will last, that will keep. Um, so as far as, like, adhesives, um, rabbit skin glue is a popular ground for oil painters, and um, you may find it on commercially made canvases. A lot of times, um, commercially made canvases, most times they're acrylic gesso, but, you know, you'd want to keep an eye out for uh, rabbit skin glue or hide glue. Those are still used today. Um, they've changed the formulation of paint, so you're not going to find Indian yellow paint that's made traditionally, which was made from uh, cow urine. They would um, deny cows water, and then they would oh, collect yeah, the urine. It would be really the, strong yeah. uh, color, and that's what they would use. Um, so, let's see, I'm trying to think of other, like bone, beads, you'd have to watch out for that mm. if you're a jewelry maker. Oh, uh, let's see, I'm trying to think, uh, yeah. wool yarn, yeah, wow. you wouldn't want wool or mohair, even though those uh, wool and mohair are collected um, humanely, you know, you may not want to use those, or you may want to, you know, research the, um, the business, the business itself that makes this. Just how humane it yeah. is. Yeah. And then you have to, you have to weigh, well, is me buying synthetic yarn in the cost of the environment yeah. any, any better? So, you know, those are some decisions that you'll have to make. I try to do the kindest to the earth, um, choices that I can make and, um, that you can live with. That I, yeah. yeah. Uh, but it's hard. I mean, it's so hard. You you think from everything you buy your children to wear, you think, well, was that made in the sweatshop? Was it made, you know, what was it made from? It's so hard. It, but you do vote with your dollar. So, you know, just by not buying, you know, Kalinsky Sable brushes, we may be, you know, cutting down a little bit on the, the fur trade. You know, they're certainly not going to kill the animals for the brushes. They might kill them with a coat still and use the leftovers for the brushes. But, um you know, we can make an impact. Um, but, and also, if you have pets, please be aware of the, the products that you do use. Uh, harsh solvents, resins, um, things like that. Those fumes are toxic, and um, you probably want to make sure that you don't have children or pets or uh, even yourself around some of them because some of them are really nasty. So that's what I'd be on the lookout for. Um, any sort of adhesive, make sure that the adhesive is not animal-based, if that's a concern. Um, I'm trying to think. Are there, are there like, I don't know, what do I want to say, like tag words that were in it, you know, like how there's like 70 different names for sugars or fake sugars, like are there tag words or do they always say oh, animal um, or rabbit or so that you really know? Yeah, look for hide, gelatin, um, let's see, casein, yeah, casein paints, that comes from, uh, from milk, from cows, 
Um, yeah, you want to look for wool. Usually, like all yarn is going to have the fiber content. Right. So there'd be wool or mohair yes, or yeah. uh, alpaca or whatever. Um, Angora. Angora, yep. So, yeah, just, you know, read your labels and, you know, you can also go to any of these companies' websites, any of um, the paint manufacturers, uh, they have this, uh, pro this program called ASTM and it's like the Associations or Standards Testing Materials, mm -hmm. something, I don't know exactly what it stands for, but they'll have, you'll be able to get all of that information, all the ingredients that are listed, the toxicity levels, light fastness, stuff like that through the manufacturer's websites. For artist quality materials, you're a little on your own for craft quality materials, they don't generally list all that stuff. And student grade stuff um, should be non-toxic, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't have gelatin in it or casein or any of the other products that, um, that you might be, you know, concerned with. I know like some people that are allergic to wheat, you know, their kids, you know, they oh, play with yeah. Play-Doh and they get sick, you know, right, because that's right. made from wheat. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, and a lot of glues are made from wheat too. So um, I try not to get stressed out about it. I'm aware of it, but um, I'd rather buy one brush that's going to last me 20 years that has animal fur in it than buy 50 synthetic brushes that I have to replace that are going to go in the trash in the landfill. So, yeah. not a perfect vegetarian, I guess. Right. But, hey, you do what you can do, who, and if who, it's important to you, then perfect, absolutely. So. Abs what's that? I'm sorry. I said, who is perfect? Nobody's perfect. <laughs> Especially not me. Uh, well, that's it. I wanted to take a little extra time for that question, so I apologize for this being a super long video, but um, hey, thank you for watching. Thumbs up and subscribe if you like this video, and until next time, happy crafting. Bye, guys.